Section 1 of The Mask of Anarchy by Percy Bysshe Shelley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. The Mask of Anarchy, a poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Now first published with a preface by Lee Hunt. Hope is strong, justice and truth their winged child have found. Revolt of Islam. London, Edward Moxon, 64 New Bond Street, 1832. Preface. This poem was written by Mr. Shelley on occasion of the bloodshed at Manchester in the year 1819. I was editor of the Examiner at that time, and it was sent to me to be inserted or not in that journal, as I thought fit. I did not insert it, because I thought that the public at large had not become sufficiently discerning to do justice to the sincerity and kind-heartedness of the spirit that walked in this flaming robe of verse. His charity was avowedly more than proportionate to his indignation, yet I thought that even the suffering part of the people, judging not unnaturally from their own feelings, and from the exasperation which suffering produces before it produces knowledge, would believe a hundredfold in his anger, to what they would in his good intention, and this made me fear that the common enemy would take advantage of the mistake to do them both a disservice. Mr. Shelley's writings have since aided the general progress of knowledge in bringing about a wiser period, and an effusion which would have got him cruelly misrepresented a few years back, will now do unequivocal honour to his memory, and show everybody what a most considerate and kind as well as fervent heart, the cause of the world has lost. The poem, though written purposely in a lax and familiar measure, is highly characteristical of the author. It has the usual ardour of his tone, the unbounded sensibility by which he combines the most domestic with the most remote and fanciful images, and the patience so beautifully checking, and in fact produced by the extreme impatience of his moral feeling. His patience is the deposit of many impatiences, acting upon an equal measure of understanding and moral taste. His wisdom is the wisdom of a heart overcharged with sensibility, acquiring the profoundest notions of justice from the completest sympathy, and at once taking refuge from its pain, and working out its extremist purposes, in the adoption of a stubborn and loving fortitude which neutralises resistance. His very strokes of humour, while they startle with their extravagance and even ghastliness, cut to the heart with pathos. The fourth and fifth stanzas, for instance, of this poem, involve an allusion which becomes affecting from our knowing what he must have felt when he wrote it. It is to his children, who were taken from him by the late Lord Chancellor, under that preposterous law, by which every succeeding age might be made to blush for the tortures inflicted on the opinions of its predecessor. Anarchy the skeleton, riding through the streets and grinning and bowing on each side of him, as well as if his education had cost ten millions to the nation, is another instance of the union of ludicrousness with terror. Hope, looking more like despair, and laying herself down before his horse's feet to die, is a touching image. The description of the rise and growth of the public enlightenment, upborne on wings whose grain was as the light of sunny rain, and producing thoughts as he went, as stars from night's loose hair are shaken, till on a sudden the prostrate multitude look up, and ankle deep in blood, hope, that made him most serene, was walking with a quiet mien, is rich with the author's usual treasury of imagery and splendid words. The sixty-third is a delicious stanza, producing a most happy and comforting picture in the midst of visions of blood and tumult. We see the light from its cottage window, the substantial blessings of freedom are nobly described, and lastly, the advice given by the poet, the great national measure recommended by him, is singularly striking as a political anticipation. It advises what has since taken place, and what was felt by the grown wisdom of the age to be the only thing which could take place, with effect as a final rebuke and nullification of the Tories, to wit, a calm, lawful and inflexible preparation for resistance, in the shape of a protesting multitude, 
the few against the many, the laborious and suffering against the spoilt children of monopoly, mankind against Tory kind. It is true, the poet recommends that there should be no active resistance come what might, which is a piece of fortitude, however effective, which we believe was not contemplated by the political unions. Yet in point of the spirit of the thing, the success he anticipates has actually occurred, and after his very fashion, for there really has been no resistance, except by multitudinous protest. The Tories, however desirous they showed themselves to draw their swords, did not draw them. The battle was won without a blow. Mr. Shelley's countrymen know how anxious he was for the advancement of the common good, but they have yet to become acquainted with his anxiety in behalf of this particular means of it, reform. The first time I heard from him was upon the subject. It was before I knew him, and while he was a student at Oxford in the year 1811. So early did he begin his career of philanthropy. Mankind and their interests were scarcely ever out of his thoughts. It was a moot point when he entered your room, whether he would begin with some half-pleasant, half-pensive joke, or quote something Greek, or ask some question about public affairs. I remember his coming upon me when I had not seen him for a long time, and after grappling my hands with both his, in his usual fervent manner, sitting down, and looking at me very earnestly with a deep, though not melancholy, interest in his face. We were sitting in a cottage study with our knees to the fire, to which we had been getting nearer and nearer in the comfort of finding ourselves together. The pleasure of seeing him was my only feeling at the moment, and the air of domesticity about us was so complete that I thought he was going to speak of some family matter, either his or my own, when he asked me at the close of an intensity of pause what was the amount of the national debt. I used to rally him on the apparent inconsequentiality of his manner upon these occasions, and he was always ready to carry on the joke, because he said that my laughter did not hinder my being in earnest. With deepest love and admiration was my laughter mixed, or I should not have ventured upon paying him the compliment of it. I have now before me his corrected proof of an anonymous pamphlet which he wrote in the year 1817, entitled, A Proposal for Putting Reform to the Vote Through the Country. I will make an extract or two from it to show how zealous he was on the subject, how generous in the example which he offered to set in behalf of reform, and how judicious as well as fervent this most calumniated and noble spirit could be in recommending the most avowed of his opinions. The title page of the proof is scrawled over with sketches of trees and foliage, which was a habit of his in the intervals of thinking, whenever he had a pen or pencil in hand. He would indulge it while waiting for you at an inn, or in a doorway, scratching his elms and oak trees on the walls. He did them very spiritedly, and with what the painters call a gusto, particularly in point of grace. If he had room, he would add a cottage and a piece of water, with a sailing boat mooring among the trees. This was his beau ideal of a life, the repose of which was to be earned by zeal for his species, and warranted by the common good. What else the image of a boat brings to the memory of those who have lost him, I will not say, especially if he is still with us in his writings. But it is worth observing how agreeably this habit of sketching trees and bowers evinced the gentleness of my friend's nature, the longing he had for rest, and the smallness of his personal desires. It has been hastily implied in a late notice of him, in a periodical work, that he was an aristocrat by disposition as well as birth, a conclusion natural enough even with intelligent men who have been bred among aristocratical influences. But it is a pity that any such person should give it as their opinion, because it tends to confirm inferior understandings in a similar delusion, and to make the vulgarity of would-be refinement still more confident in its assumptions. It is acknowledged on all hands that Mr. Shelley's mind was not one to be measured by common rules, not even by such as the vulgar, great or small, take for uncommon ones, or for cunning pieces of corporate knowledge snugly kept between one another. If there is anything which I can affirm of my beloved friend with as much confidence as the fact of his being benevolent, 
and a friend, it is that he was totally free from mistakes of this kind, that he never for one moment confounded the claims of real and essential with those of conventional refinements, or allowed one to be substituted for the other in his mind by any compromise of his self-love. I will admit it to be possible that there were moments in which he might have been deceived in his estimation of people's manners, in consequence of those to which he had been early accustomed, but the charge implied against him involves a conscious, or at least an habitual, preference of what I call high-bred manners for their own sakes, apart from the natures of those who exhibited them, and to the disadvantage of those to whom they had not been taught. I can affirm that it is a total mistake, and that he partook of no such weakness. I have seen him indeed draw himself up with a sort of irrepressible air of dignified objection, when moral vulgarity was betrayed in his presence, whatever might have been the rank of the betrayer. But nobody could hail with greater joy and simplicity, or meet upon more equal grounds, the instinct of a real delicacy and good intention, come in what shape it might. Why should he have done otherwise? He was Shelley, and not merely a man of that name. What had ordinary high life and its pretensions, and the getting together of a few people for the sake of giving themselves a little importance, to do with his universal affinities? It was finally said one day in my hearing by Mr. Hazlitt, when asked why he could not temporise a little now and then, or make a compromise with an untruth, that it was not worth his while. It was not worth Mr. Shelley's while to be an aristocrat. His spirit was large enough to take ten aristocracies into the hollow of his hand, and look at them as I have seen him look at insects from a tree, certainly with no thought either of superiority or the reverse, but with a curious interest. That quintessence of gentlemanly demeanour which was observable in Mr. Shelley, in drawing-rooms, when he was not over-thoughtful, was nothing but an exquisite combination of sense, moral grace, and habitual sympathy. It was more dignified than what is called dignity in others, because it was the heart of the thing itself, or intrinsic worth, graced by the sincerest idealism and not a response made by imputed merit to the homage of the imputers. The best conventional dignity could have no more come up to it than the trick of an occasion to the truth of a life. Footnote. The consciousness of possessing the respect of others, apart from any reason for it but a conventional one, will sometimes produce a really fine expression of countenance where the nature is good. On the other hand, I have seen Mr. Shelley, from a doubt of the sympathy of those around him, suddenly sink from the happier look above described into an expression of misgiving and even of destitution that was extremely touching. It arose out of a sudden impression that all the sympathy was on his side. Sympathy is undoubtedly the one thing needful and final, and though the receipt of it on false grounds appears the most formidable obstacle in the way of its true ascendancy, and is so, Yet out of the very spirit of that fact will come the salvation of the world. For when once a right view of it gets into fashion, the prejudices as well as the understandings of mankind will be as much on that side as they are against it now, and the acceleration of good be without a drawback. End of footnote. But if an aristocracy of intellect and morals were required, he was the man for one of their leaders. High and princely was the example he could set to an aristocracy of a different sort, as the reader will see by the following extract from his pamphlet. The late death of an extraordinary man of genius, the delight of nations, and the special glory of his country, has just shown the blushing world what little things could be done for him, dead or alive, by the, quote, great men whom he condescended to glorify. The manager of a Scottish theatre, to his immortal credit, Footnote. Mr. Murray, I remember the gentlemanly paternity of his father's manner on the English stage, and the fine eyes of his sister, Mrs. Henry Siddons, and was not surprised to find generosity in such a stock. End of footnote. The manager of a Scottish theatre, to his immortal credit, has contributed in furtherance of the erection of a monument to him, precisely the same sum as was drawn forth out of the money-bags of a Scottish duke, in the receipt of nearly a thousand pounds a day. 
The sum is the same that is mentioned in the ensuing paragraph from Mr. Shelley's pamphlet. After proposing a meeting of the Friends of Reform for the purpose of recommending his plan to the nation, the author notices the expenses which would probably be incurred, and then makes the following offer. I have an income of a thousand a year, on which I support my wife and children in decent comfort, and from which I satisfy certain large claims of general justice. Footnote. By these claims of justice, he meant the wants of his friends and the poor. I do not wish, God knows, to dispute the phrase with him, but such were the notions of this singular, quote, aristocrat, a most equal-sighted fellow-creature. End of footnote. Should any plan resembling that which I have proposed be determined on by you, I will give one hundred pound, being a tenth part of one year's income, towards its object. And I will not deem so proudly of myself as to believe that I shall stand alone in this respect, when any rational or consistent scheme for the public benefit shall have received the sanction of those great and good men who have devoted themselves for its preservation. The delight of talking about my friend has led me into a longer preface than I intended to write. I did not think of detaining the reader so long from his poem. Most probably, indeed, I have not detained him. I will, however, make the other and longer extract without further remark. If this pamphlet was the work of an aristocrat, even in the passages where it recommends time to be given for the abolition of his class, he was surely the strangest republican of an aristocrat that ever existed, and had the oddest notions of what was puerile. Footnote. See his works pass him. A multitude of passages might be quoted, such as no aristocrat would write out of mere spleen, or with greater pride of his own. They are too frequent, earnest, and full of thought. If Mr. Shelley met with a gird at things aristocratical in any book he was reading, he marked it as worthy to be noted. I was looking the other day into a Diogenes Laertius that belonged to him, and almost the first passage I met with thus marked was the saying of the biographer's namesake, in which birth and honours are treated with contempt. I am not here begging the question against such things. I am merely recording my friend's real opinions. The only sentiment by which a privileged class is to be vindicated may claim a fair discussion, and the settlement of it be safely left to the growth of the sentiment itself, and its expansion into a freedom from its own necessity. End of footnote. A certain degree of coalition, says he, among the sincere friends of reform, in whatever shape, is indispensable to the success of this proposal. The friends of universal, or of limited suffrage, of annual or triennial parliaments, ought to settle the subjects on which they disagree, when it is known whether the nation wills that measure on which they are all agreed. It is trivial to discuss what species of reform should have place, when it yet remains a question whether there will be any reform or no. Meanwhile, nothing remains for me but to state explicitly my sentiments on this subject. The statement is indeed quite foreign to the merits of the proposal in itself, and I should have suppressed it until called upon to subscribe such a requisition as I have suggested. If the question which it is natural to ask, as to what are the sentiments of the person who originates the scheme, could have received in any other manner a more simple or direct reply, it appears to me that annual parliaments ought to be adopted as an immediate measure, as one which strongly tends to preserve the liberty and happiness of the nation. It would enable men to cultivate those energies on which the performance of the political duties belonging to the citizen of a free state, as the rightful guardian of its prosperity, essentially depends. It would familiarise men with liberty by disciplining them to an habitual acquaintance with its forms. Political institution is undoubtedly susceptible of such improvements as no rational person can consider possible, so long as the present degraded condition to which the vital imperfections in the existing system of government has reduced the vast multitude of men shall subsist. The securest method of arriving at such beneficial innovations is to proceed gradually and with caution, or in the place of that order and freedom which the friends of reform assert to be violated now, anarchy and despotism will follow. Annual parliaments have my entire assent. I will not state those general reasonings in their favour which Mr. Cobbett and other writers have already made familiar to the public mind. 
with respect to universal suffrage, I confess I consider its adoption in the present unprepared state of public knowledge and feeling, fraught with peril. I think that none but those who register their names as paying a certain small sum in direct taxes ought at present to send members to Parliament. The consequence of the immediate extension of the elective franchise to every male adult will be to place power in the hands of men who have been rendered brutal and torpid and ferocious by ages of slavery. It is to suppose that the qualities belonging to a demagogue are such as are sufficient to endow a legislator. I allow Major Cartwright's arguments to be unanswerable. Abstractedly, it is the right of every human being to have a share in the government, but Mr. Payne's arguments are also unanswerable. A pure republic may be shown by inferences the most obvious and irresistible to be that system of social order the fittest to produce the happiness and promote the genuine eminence of man. Yet nothing can be less consistent with reason or afford smaller hopes of any beneficial issue than the plan which should abolish the regal and the aristocratical branches of our constitution before the public mind, through many gradations of improvement, shall have arrived at the maturity which can disregard those symbols of its childhood. I need not point out to the reader's attention the singular and happy anticipations contained in the above extract. Neither shall I stop to inquire how far Mr. Shelley would have thought the feasibilities of improvement hastened by the events that have taken place of late years. Events, one of them in particular, the glorious three days, which it would have repaid him for all his endurances, had he lived to see. And who shall say that he has not seen them? For if ever there was a man upon earth of a more spiritual nature than ordinary, partaking of the errors and perturbations of his species, but seeing and working through them with a seraphical purpose of good, such a one was Percy Bysshe Shelley. L. H. End of section 1「Section 2 of the Mask of Anarchy – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – The Mask of Anarchy by Percy Bysshe Shelley As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met murder on the way, he had a mask like Castlereagh, very smooth he looked yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight, for one by one and two by two he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. Next came fraud, and he had on, like Lord Eldon, an ermined gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. And the little children, who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out by them. Clothed with the Bible, as with light, and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth next, hypocrisy, on a crocodile rode by. And many more destructions played, in this ghastly masquerade, all disguised, even to the eyes, like bishops, lawyers, peers, or spies. Last came anarchy, he rode on a white horse, splashed with blood. He was pale even to the lips, like death in the apocalypse. And he wore a kingly crown, and in his grasp a sceptre shone, and on his brow this mark I saw, I am God and King and Law. With a pace stately and fast over English land he passed, trampling to a mire of blood the adoring multitude and a mighty troop around with their trampling shook the ground, waving each a bloody sword for the service of their lord. And with glorious triumph they rode through England, proud and gay, drunk as with intoxication of the wine of desolation. O'er fields and towns from sea to sea, past the pageant swift and free, tearing up and trampling down till they came to London town. And each dweller, panic-stricken, felt his heart with terror sicken, hearing the tempestuous cry of the triumph of anarchy. For with pomp to meet him came, clothed in arms like blood and flame, 
the hired murderers who did sing, Thou art God and law and king. We have waited, weak and lone, for thy coming, mighty one. Our purses are empty, our swords are cold. Give us glory and blood and gold. Lawyers and priests, a motley crowd, to the earth their pale brows bowed, like a bad prayer not over loud, whispering, Thou art law and God. Then all cried with one accord, Thou art king and God and lord, Anarchy, to thee we bow, Be thy name made holy now. And Anarchy, the skeleton, Bowed and grinned to every one, As well as if his education Had cost ten millions to the nation. For he knew the palaces of our kings Were nightly his, His the sceptre, crown and globe, And the gold in woven robe. So he sent his slaves before to seize upon the bank and tower, and was proceeding with intent to meet his pensioned parliament, when one fled past, a maniac maid, and her name was Hope, she said, but she looked more like despair, and she cried out in the air, My father, time, is weak and grey with waiting for a better day. See how idiot-like he stands, fumbling with his palsied hands. He has had child after child, and the dust of death is piled over every one but me. Misery, oh, misery! Then she lay down in the street, right before the horse's feet, expecting with a patient eye, murder, fraud, and anarchy. When between her and her foes, a mist, a light, an image rose, small at first and weak and frail, like the vapour of the veil, till, as clouds grow on the blast, like tower-crowned giants striding fast, and glare with lightnings as they fly, and speak in thunder to the sky. It grew, a shape arrayed in mail, brighter than the viper's scale, and upborne on wings whose grain was as the light of sunny rain. On its helm, seen far away, a planet like the morning's lay, and those plumes it light rained through, like a shower of crimson dew. With step as soft as wind it passed o'er the heads of men, so fast that they knew the presence there, and looked, and all was empty air. As flowers beneath the footstep waken, as stars from night's loose hair are shaken, as waves arise when loud winds call, thoughts sprung where'er that step did fall. And the prostrate multitude looked, and ankle deep in blood, Hope, that maiden most serene, was walking with a quiet mien. And anarchy, the ghastly birth, lay dead upon the earth. The horse of death, tameless as wind, fled, and with his hoofs did grind to dust the murderers thronged behind. A rushing light of clouds and splendour, a sense, awakening and yet tender, was heard and felt, and at its close these words of joy and fear arose as if their own indignant earth, which gave the sons of England birth, had felt their blood upon her brow, and shuddering with a mother's throe, had turned every drop of blood by which her face had been bedewed, to an accent unwithstood, as if her heart had cried aloud. Men of England, heirs of glory, heroes of unwritten story, nurslings of one mighty mother, hopes of her and one another. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. What is freedom? Ye can tell that which slavery is too well, for its very name has grown to an echo of your own. Tis to work and have such pay as just keeps life from day to day in your limbs, as in a cell for the tyrants used to dwell, so that ye for them are made. Loom and plough, and sword and spade, With or without your own will, Bent to their defence and nourishment. Tis to see your children weak With their mother's pine and peak, When the winter winds are bleak, They are dying whilst I speak. Tis to hunger for such diet As the rich man in his riot Cast to the fat dogs That lie surfeiting beneath his eye. Tis to let the ghost of gold take from toil a thousandfold, more than e'er its substance could in the tyrannies of old. Paper coin, 
that forgery of the title deeds which ye hold to something of the worth of the inheritance of the earth. Tis to be a slave in soul, and to hold no strong control over your own wills, but be all that others make of ye. And at length when ye complain, with a murmur weak and vain, tis to see the tyrant's crew ride over your wives and you, blood is on the grass like dew. Then it is to feel revenge, fiercely thirsting to exchange, blood for blood and wrong for wrong. Do not thus when ye are strong. Birds find rest in narrow nest when weary of the winged quest. Beasts find fare in woody lair when storm and snow are in the air. Asses, swine have litter spread and with fitting food are fed. All things have a home but one. Thou, O Englishman, hast none. This is slavery. Savage men or wild beasts within a den would endure not as ye do, but such ills they never knew. What art thou, freedom? Oh, could slaves answer from their living graves this demand? Tyrants would flee like a dream's dim imagery. Thou art not, as impostors say, a shadow soon to pass away, a superstition, and a name echoing from the caves of fame. For the labourer thou art bread, and a comely table spread from his daily labour come in a neat and happy home. Thou art clothes and fire and food for the trampled multitude. No, in countries that are free, such starvation cannot be as in England now we see. To the rich thou art a check when his foot is on the neck of his victim, thou dost make that he treads upon a snake. Thou art justice, Ne'er for gold may thy righteous laws be sold, as laws are in England. Thou shieldest alike the high and low. Thou art wisdom. Freedom never dreams that God will damn for ever all who think those things untrue of which priests make such ado. Thou art peace. Never by thee would blood and treasure wasted be, as tyrants wasted them, when all leagued to quench thy flame in gall. What if English toil and blood was poured forth, even as a flood, it availed, O liberty, to dim, but not extinguish thee. Thou art love, the rich have kissed thy feet, and like him, following Christ, give their substance to the free, and through the rough world follow thee. O turn their wealth to arms, and make war for thy beloved sake, on wealth, and war, and fraud, whence they drew the power which is their prey. Science and poetry and thought are thy lamps. They make the lot of the dwellers in a cot, so serene they curse it not. Spirit, patience, gentleness, all that can adorn and bless, art thou. Let deeds not words express thine exceeding loveliness. Let a great assembly be, of the fearless, of the free, on some spot of English ground where the plains stretch wide around. Let the blue sky overhead, the green earth on which ye tread, all that must eternal be, witness the solemnity. From the corners uttermost of the bounds of English coast, from every hut, village and town, where those who live and suffer moan for others' misery and their own. From the workhouse and the prison, where pale as corpses newly risen, Women and children, young and old, groan for pain and weep for cold. From the haunts of daily life, where is waged the daily strife, with common wants and common cares, which sow the human heart with tears. Lastly, from the palaces, where the murmur of distress echoes like the distant sound of a wind alive around. Those prison halls of wealth and fashion, where some few feel such compassion for those who groan and toil and wail, as must make their brethren pale. Ye who suffer woes untold, or to feel, or to behold your lost country bought and sold with a price of blood and gold. Let a vast assembly be, and with great solemnity, declare with measured words that ye are, as God has made ye, free, be your strong and simple words, keen to wound as sharpened swords, and wide as targe let them be, with their shade to cover ye. 
Let the tyrants pour around with a quick and startling sound, like the loosening of a sea, troops of armed emblazonry. Let the charged artillery drive till the dead air seems alive, with the clash of clanging wheels and the tramp of horses' heels. Let the fixed bayonet gleam with sharp desire to wet its bright point in English blood, looking keen as one for food. Let the horsemen's scimitars wheel and flash like spheless stars, thirsting to eclipse their burning in a sea of death and mourning. Stand ye calm and resolute, like a forest, close and mute, with folded arms and looks, which are weapons of an unvanquished war. And let panic, who outspeeds the career of armed steeds, pass a disregarded shade through your phalanx undismayed. Let the laws of your own land, good or ill between ye stand, hand to hand and foot to foot, arbiters of the dispute. The old laws of England, they, whose reverend heads with age are grey, children of a wiser day, and whose solemn voice must be thine own echo, liberty. On those who first should violate such sacred heralds in their state, rest the blood that must ensue, and it will not rest on you. And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there, slash and stab and maim and hew, what they like, that let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes, and little fear and less surprise, look upon them as they stay, till their rage has died away. Then they will return with shame to the place from which they came, and the blood thus shed will speak in hot blushes on their cheek. Every woman in the land will point at them as they stand, they will hardly dare to greet their acquaintance in the street. And the bold true warriors, who have hugged danger in wars, will turn to those who would be free, ashamed of such base company. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become like oppression's thundered doom, ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, again, again. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep hath fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. End of section 2「Section 3 of the Mask of Anarchy – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – Shelley, Peter Lou, and the Mask of Anarchy – by H. Buxton Foreman – London, printed for private circulation, 1887 – Shelley, Peter Lou, and the Mask of Anarchy – A lecture delivered to the Shelley Society on the 9th of February, 1887 – by H. Buxton Foreman. Ladies and gentlemen, in preparing for the press the facsimile of the holograph Mask of Anarchy, which was the subject of some talk at our last meeting, I have been led to consider the circumstances that induced Shelley to write the poem, and the conditions in which it was produced, and I propose this evening to read to you what I have written on the subject. The year 1819 was a critical one in the history of reform, Democratic agitation had been rife among the British working classes for some years. Monster public gatherings were becoming more and more frequent, and in the summer of 1819 the movement culminated in a huge concourse at Manchester. On the 31st of July, an advertisement in the Manchester Observer set forth that a meeting would be held on the 9th of August in a large open space called St. Peter's Field with the view of urging forward parliamentary reform. The magistrates declared that such a meeting would be illegal, and its promoters postponed it, while endeavouring to compass their end in a more formal manner, but eventually held their meeting on the 16th of August 1819 in St. Peter's Field. The people poured into Manchester by thousands from all the surrounding towns, coming peaceably and in order, though for a purpose pronounced to be illegal. 
it was arranged that the chair should be taken by the noisy demagogue Henry Hunt, best known as Orator Hunt, and not connected in any way with Lee Hunt. The authorities at Manchester had made extensive but muddlesome preparations for what they termed the preservation of peace. They had ready for action a large number of special constables, some yeomanry cavalry, and some three hundred hussars, but although the authorities had ample knowledge and warning of the meeting, they failed to arrange beforehand any definite plan of action. They made no effort to arrest the ringleaders on their way to St. Peter's Field, and it was not till Hunt was on the platform, surrounded by a densely packed and enormous crowd of peaceable and orderly men, women and children, that an absurd attempt to take him into custody was made. When the warrant for the apprehension of the reform leaders was handed to the chief constable for execution, he averred that he should need military aid. To this end, some forty of the yeomanry cavalry were dispatched to make their way through the crowd, an obvious impossibility, and were speedily hemmed in on all sides and stuck fast. They do not appear at first to have done or received serious harm, but when their mission was found to have failed, a hasty order was given to the three hundred hussars who were in attendance hard by to disperse the crowd. Footnote 1. Good God, sir! Do you not see how they are attacking the yeomanry? Disperse the crowd! On this, the word forward was instantly given. The trumpet sounded and the cavalry dashed among the multitude. See, A History of the Thirty Years' Peace by Harriet Martineau, Four volumes, 1877, volume 1, pages 283 to 314, for a full account of the whole episode. End of footnote. They made a vigorous charge, resulting in a terrific scene of confusion and indiscriminate slashing and overturning, and in the end about six people were killed outright, while twenty or thirty were wounded by the sabres of the cavalry and some fifty or more injured by being trodden under foot and otherwise maltreated. Such, in a few words, was the Manchester Massacre, as Shelley called it, or, as it is often called, the Peterloo Massacre. When the news of this ugly business reached Shelley at Leghorn, he was beyond measure transported by resentment against the local authorities and the government. The affair took place during the administration of the Earl of Liverpool, when Lord Eldon was Lord High Chancellor, Viscount Sidmouth Home Secretary, and Lord Castlereagh Foreign Secretary. Lord Sidmouth publicly expressed the satisfaction of the Prince Regent with the, quote, prompt, decisive and efficient measures for the preservation of the public tranquillity, end quote, adopted by the local authorities. Lord Eldon equally supported the magistrates, and for the rest, the cup of iniquity, both of Castlereagh and of Eldon, had long, in Shelley's eyes, been full to overflowing, so that he might well give to murder a mask like the one, and to fraud an ermined gown like that of the other. It is thus that Mrs. Shelley, in her note on the poems of 1819, describes her husband's feelings on this occasion. Though Shelley's first eager desire to excite his countrymen to resist openly the oppressions existent, during the good old times, had faded with early youth. Still, his warmest sympathies were for the people. He was a republican and loved a democracy. He looked on all human beings as inheriting an equal right to possess the dearest privileges of our nature, the necessaries of life, when fairly earned by labour and intellectual instruction. His hatred of any despotism, that looked upon the people as not to be consulted or protected from want and ignorance, was intense. He was residing near Leghorn at Villa Valsovano, writing the Cenci, when the news of the Manchester massacre reached us. It roused in him violent emotions of indignation and compassion. The great truth that the many, if accordant and resolute, could control the few, as was shown some years after, made him long to teach his injured countrymen how to resist. Inspired by these feelings, he wrote The Mask of Anarchy. He may be questioned whether the words, writing the Cenci, were meant to be taken literally. Professor Dowden tells us, Life of Shelley, Volume 2, page 279, that 
that on Sunday the 8th of August Shelley brought the first rough draft of the Cenci to an end, and that during some later days of the same month he was engaged in copying and correcting the poem. I have reason to know that the words first rough draft are not quoted from any contemporary record, but are of the nature of an interpretation, there being no precise knowledge at present as to the degree of finish which characterised the tragedy as completed by Shelley on the 8th of August. It seems certain, however, that a week later than that it was not absolutely finished. On the 11th of August he was recopying some portion of it, and on the 15th of August he wrote to Lee Hunt, Prose Works, Volume 4, page 115, my Prometheus is finished, and I am also on the eve of completing another work, totally different from anything you might conjecture that I should write, of a more popular kind, and, if anything of mine could deserve attention, of higher claims. The work referred to is the Cenci, and as the middle of August is generally accepted as the time of completion, it is not improbable that the 15th was actually the eve of the tragedy's birthday. Mrs. Shelley appears to have assisted later in copying, but even of this there seems to be no record after the 20th of August. Now if the 16th was actually the day on which Shelley put the last finishing touch to his tragedy, as I think we may reasonably assume it to have been, in the absence of further evidence, the coincidence was sufficiently remarkable. For that was the very day on which the Manchester magistrates, in the plenitude of their wisdom and forethought for the public tranquillity, took order for the enactment of the tragedy in St. Peter's Field, which was to provide him with the subject of his next considerable poem. But these, we must recollect, were not the days of Reuters telegrams, nor did news reach Leghorn from England by post in two or three days. The chances are that Shelley remained ignorant of the massacre till August had given place to September. By the ninth of September, he was sending a printed copy of the Cenci to Peacock, and there is a letter to Mr. Ollier in which he mentions the indescribable trouble he had with the Italian printer in getting the work through the press at Leghorn. Now, this indescribable trouble must certainly have occupied a plurality of weeks, as anyone who is familiar with printing processes at their best must be convinced. I do not doubt, therefore, that the business of which the poet was occupied, when he heard first of the meeting in St. Peter's Field, and its sanguinary results, must have been the printing, and not the writing, of the Cenci. How the indescribable trouble inflicted on him by Signor Massey and his compositors must have shrunk into insignificance when he opened the English newspapers, and read of the hideous and sanguinary bungle, it is not difficult to picture to one's thought. Footnote. Professor Dowden, Life of Shelley, Volume 2, page 279, says that the book was printed at Massey's, adding, however, in a footnote, I have no positive evidence that Massey was Shelley's printer, but it seems morally certain that to Massey he would go. End footnote. Let us look in imagination into that glazed-in loggia at the top of Villa Valsovano, see Mrs. Shelley's note on the Cenci, where the summer had seen Shelley at work upon the greatest tragedy produced since Shakespeare's hand left working in that kind. Do we not see the same Shelley, dividing his time between attention to the indescribable proof-sheets of the said tragedy, damp from Printer Massey's office, and boiling over the news contained in the papers from his abandoned country, where a less remote if less poetic tragedy had just been enacted. Whether Massey's mangling of the majestic lines of the Cenci, or thoughts of that ghastly rush of cavalry to mangle the limbs of his unarmed countrymen, drove him the oftener to the glazed front of his airy cell, who shall say, Ibid. Whether when driven from his high retreat to rush into Leghorn and make personal representations to the bewildered and bewildering printers, the completed tragedy of medieval Italy, or the poem already getting forward on the new tragedy of modern England, was uppermost in his thoughts. Who shall guess? But we cannot put aside the recurring picture of the poet, starting up once and again with impulsive fingers thrust through his wild locks, stung now by some blunder of the printers in transferring from manuscript to print the unfamiliar language of his fresh great summer task, Footnote. 
Quote, so now my summer task is ended, Mary. Leon and Sithna. Dedication. End footnote. Now, by some detail, or imagined detail of the massacre, to find a momentary relief in gazing down from the study, quote, halfway between the town of Leghorn and Montenero, Mrs. Shelley's note on the Cenci. From that study he could drink in through the eyes the benign influence of the, quote, near sea, which he loved, and could for a moment calm his vexed spirit with the, quote, wide prospect of fertile country, Ibid, of the land of his choice. But we have not to depend on sheer imagination in order to realise the vivid series of impressions kept up in Shelley's mind. Not only have we in our hands the admirable poem which he wrote on the impulse of this ugly episode in the history of reform in England, but letters and memoranda are preserved for our guidance. On the 6th of September, when well through his troubles with the Leghorn printers, he wrote a letter to his publisher, Mr. Ollier, announcing his intention to send the Cenci for publication, and commenting thus on the Manchester Massacre. Shelley Memorials, pages 118 to 19. The same day that your letter came, came the news of the Manchester work, and the torrent of my indignation has not yet done boiling in my veins. I wait anxiously to hear how the country will express its sense of this bloody, murderous oppression of its destroyers. Something must be done. What yet I know not. Footnote. This quotation from the Cenci, Act 3, Scene 1, lines 86 to 7, gives us a glimpse of the way in which the real and literary tragedies were dividing his mind. The torrent of his indignation did not, it seems, even give him time to reflect whether Mr. Ollier would understand the words, oppression of its destroyers, as meaning oppression exercised by the persons so characterised. End footnote. Three days later he wrote to his good friend Peacock, Prose Works, Volume 4, pages 123-4, to 4, sending him a copy of the Cenci, and exhibiting an unabated interest in the Peterloo business. Many thanks for your attention in sending the papers which contain the terrible and important news of Manchester. These are, as it were, the distant thunders of the terrible storm which is approaching. The tyrants here, as in the French Revolution, have first shed blood. May their execrable lessons not be learnt with equal docility. I still think there will be no coming to close quarters until financial affairs bring the oppressors and the oppressed together. Pray let me have the earliest political news which you consider of importance at this crisis. After the lapse of twelve days more, he again addressed Peacock, further concerning the Cenci, and, inter alia, concerning the massacre. Prose Works, Volume 4, pages 124 to 6. I have received all the papers you sent me, and the examiner regularly perfumed with muriatic acid, the result of quarantine operations. What an infernal business, this of Manchester! What is to be done? Something assuredly. Footnote. Note the curious way in which the words from the Cenci, quoted to Ollier, are put in plain prose for the unsympathising peacock, the, quote, nursling of the exact and superficial school in poetry. End of footnote. H. Hunt has behaved, I think, with great spirit and coolness in the whole affair. That the poem seethed in his mind for a continuous of time is also evident from another passage in Mrs. Shelley's notes on the poems of 1819. The poem was written for the people, and is therefore in a more popular tone than usual. Portions strike as abrupt and unpolished, but many stanzas are all his own. I heard him repeat, and admired, those beginning, My father time is old and grey, before I knew to what poem they were to belong. But the most touching passage is that which describes the blessed effects of liberty. They might make a patriot of any man, whose heart was not wholly closed against his humbler fellow creatures. In what form the poem was first put into black and white, perhaps we may never know, but the chances are that it was jotted down in notebooks or on scraps of paper, in pencil or in ink as occasion ruled, before being reduced to its final form. However that may be, it was copied out by Mrs. Shelley, finally revised by Shelley, 
and dispatched to Lee Hunt for publication in the Examiner before November 1819. It never saw the light till 1832, for Hunt, prudent for once, thought that if given to the public in 1819, it would have a very different effect from that for which the poet designed it. When Mrs. Shelley reprinted the poem in her collected editions dating from 1839 onwards, she included a stanza not given by Hunt, but so far as the public knew, from that time till 1876, there were no means of verifying by consultation of manuscripts the readings of either the one version or the other. In 1876, some Shelley papers preserved by Lee Hunt came to the surface of the stream of time which had swamped them. And in the following year, when the third volume of my library edition of Shelley's poetical works was issued, the Mask of Anarchy was given from the very copy which Mrs. Shelley had written, and Shelley had revised with minute and scrupulous care for Hunt to publish in the Examiner. Certain peculiarities in that manuscript, notably gaps left by Mrs. Shelley and afterwards filled in by Shelley, led me to surmise that the poet had dictated the poem to his wife from rough notes, such as we know he made in ample measure of his poetic thoughts. Until the present year, 1887, the Hunt manuscript remained the sole known written authority for the text of the mask, and it did not seem very profitable that another authority would be discovered. Nevertheless, Shelley's own manuscript of the whole poem, less a few omitted lines, has at length been found, and has blown to the winds my theory of dictation, the peculiarities being the result, not of hesitant instructions to an amanuensis, but of copying out, as literally as might be, a poem which was practically completed, but required just a few finishing touches. The recovery of the holograph is a direct result of the Shelley Society's activity. Mr. Frederick S. Ellis, while carrying on the work of editing and supervising the Shelley Concordance, had to appeal through the columns of the Athenaeum for additions to his phalanx of workers. From communications made to Mr. Ellis in this connection, it transpired that Mrs. Shelley, in 1826, gave the holograph Mask of Anarchy to the late Sir John, then Mr. Bowring, whose son, Mr. Lewin Bowring, CSI, placed it temporarily in Mr. Ellis's hands, together with a most interesting letter sent by Mrs. Shelley with her precious gift. This letter, with some particulars of the manuscript, was at once communicated by Mr. Ellis to the Athenaeum, January 22, 1887 and arrangements were shortly made for the transfer of the manuscript and letter to their present owner, Mr. Thomas J. Wise. In a small way, the recovery of this manuscript, and its bestowal in the hands of one who will not hide it under a bushel, have made quite a stir. To Shelley specialists, the knowledge that the holograph of another of Shelley's poems is extant and accessible is necessarily gratifying, and the production of that facsimile of it which the Shelley Society is about to issue in its extra series, is a real boon, a facsimile being serviceable both for the purposes of students who desire to know more of Shelley's way of work, and for such collectors as cannot hope to possess the original. But it may be well to note the particular reasons, independent of Shelleyolatry and autograph hunting, for which the recovery of this manuscript was to be desired. The spelling of the word mask in the title was already settled, for Shelley himself wrote the heading of the Hunt manuscript, and put M-A-S-K, not M-A-S-Q-U-E. He also added the important and significant words, written on the occasion of the massacre at Manchester. But a few textual points remained on which the evidence of the holograph was desirable. For instance, stanza 9 stands thus in the Hunt manuscript, and he wore a kingly crown, and in his grasp a sceptre shone. On his brow this mark I saw. I am God, and King, and Law. Hunt altered the third line to, And on his brow this mark I saw. And Mrs. Shelley gave the second line thus, In his hand a sceptre shone, which turns out to be the reading of the holograph, though a reading which Shelley rejected in favour of that of the Hunt manuscript, where the line stands revised by his own hand. Mrs. Shelley in the passage from stanza 14, hearing the tempestuous cry of the triumph of anarchy, changed tempestuous to tremendous, 
and in stanza eighteen she altered, Thou art king and God and lord, to thou art king and law and lord, while for the expressive line, fumbling with his palsied hands, in stanza twenty-three she substituted, trembling with his palsied hands. Of none of these variations is there any trace in the holograph. Again, the lovely line in stanza 31, As flowers beneath May's footstep waken, has appeared variously with the words, the footstep, Hunt, and May's footsteps, Mrs. Shelley, but the reading of the Hunt manuscript, May's footstep, receives such confirmation as it may be thought to have needed from the holograph. Perhaps the point of most consequence for consultation of the holograph was the status of the stanza, Horses, oxen, have a home, when from daily toil they come. Household dogs, when the wind roars, find a home within warm doors. This stanza is in the holograph, but is omitted from the elaborate Hunt manuscript. Mrs. Shelley replaced it between stanzas 49 and 50, but I relegated it to the footnotes, as having been in all probability rejected by Shelley. With the holograph before me I see no reason for a change of opinion, though I find no evidence at all to speak of. The two stanzas between which Mrs. Shelley replaced it read thus, Birds find rest in narrow nest, when weary of their winged quest. Beasts find fair in woody lair, when snow and storm are in the air. Asses, swine have litter spread, and with fitting food are fed. All things have a home but one. Thou, O Englishman, hast none. My reason for thinking Shelley's rejection of this stanza likely and wise is that it carries on the comparison a little too long and tends to use up or discount the sacred word home before it occurs in its real and full significance in juxtaposition with the mention of the homeless Englishman. As the verses now stand, the thought passes over the rest of birds, the lair of beasts, the litter of asses and swine, and the home that the Englishman lacks. But with the other stanza inserted, the sequence is mingled, rest, lair, home, home, litter, home. The change effected by the omission is one which I should venture to call magical. The bearing of the holograph on the question is not strong, however. Although the stanzas are numbered in the manuscript revised for press, they are not numbered in the holograph, had both copies been numbered, I should have thought it most improbable that Shelley, who was very curious about the numbering of his verses and stanzas, would have revised with such remarkable pains the copy for the press, and yet not found out the omission by the want of correspondence in the numbers. As it is, he seems to have made one of his usual counts at this very point, for at the end of the fifty-first stanza in his copy, he has written in the margin the figure fifty-one whereas that stanza becomes the fiftieth in the final manuscript. I do not lay much stress on this, but note it for what it is worth. For the rest, I am confident that had he wanted the stanza, he would have missed it, numbers or no numbers, and I can see no ground whatever for restoring it to a place in the text. In stanza 58, there was something that looked like editorial watering down. Thou art wisdom, Freeman, never dream that God will damn for ever, said the Hunt manuscript. But Hunt printed, Freedom never dreams that God will damn for ever. And Mrs. Shelley, while restoring Freeman for freedom, put doom for damn. The holograph corresponds precisely with the Hunt manuscript, and leaves both editors answerable for their readings. Stanza 63, as revised by Shelley for the press, is science poetry and thought are they lamps they make the lot of the dwellers in a cot so serene they curse it not the rhythm of the first line was altered by the insertion of and between science and poetry in all editions published before 1877 and mrs shelley gave the fourth line as such they curse their maker not the holograph does not contain the and but it does contain both readings of the fourth line the first written boldly like the rest of the poem, the second written very small and faintly with a different pen. The words, so serene, and it, being cancelled lightly, as though the matter were yet to be further considered. In stanza 65, Hunt printed the second line as, Of the fearless, of the free, 
though the manuscript from which he published reads, Of the Fearless and the Free. This preference for a more staccato reading must, I fear, be set down to lax views of an editor's duties. At all events, Shelley's manuscript does nothing to release his friend from that imputation, and it was not to be expected that it would. Such are the principal points upon which a consultation of the holograph manuscript was to be desired, and the result, though not absolutely negative, is not very positive or copious. Over and above what we gather on these points, there are some few fresh readings, the most important of which is the cancelled stanza, From the cities where from caves, like the dead from putrid graves, troops of starvelings gliding come, living tenants of a tomb. This stanza is found between what are the 67th and 68th in the printed version, original and library editions, 68th and 69th in Mrs. Shelley's and Mr. Rossetti's editions. It gives place to the two fine stanzas, From the workhouse and the prison, Where pale as corpses newly risen, Women, children, young and old, Groan for pain and weep for cold. From the haunts of daily life, Where is waged the daily strife, With common wants and common cares, Which sows the human heart with tears. No one will regret the removal of the old stanza from the text, But it has great interest as a cancelled reading. On the other hand, the holograph yields some variations of a more positive value. Stanza 30 in the manuscript prepared by Shelley for the press reads thus, With step as soft as wind it passed, O'er the heads of men so fast, That they knew the presence there, And looked, and all was empty air. The holograph reads but for and in the last line, And I am disposed to prefer that reading, Although we cannot be certain that the other was a mistake of transcription, which Shelley failed to discover. In stanza 57, the holograph gives the fourth line as, Shields to like both high and low, but Mrs. Shelley's transcript gives, Shields to like the high and low. It is possible to contend for both as stronger and more emphatic, but it is certainly less accurate. We do not say, both the cat and the kitten are alike, because there can be no question of one being alike and the other not alike. Mrs. Shelley may very well have had Shelley by her to be appealed to while she copied the poem, and I should not consider the evidence of the carefully revised manuscript prepared for press as set aside by the holograph, save in the case of obvious error or indisputable inferiority. Such a case, not of obvious error but of indisputable inferiority, is to be found in stanza 79. Mrs. Shelley's copy reads, Stand ye calm and resolute, like a forest close and mute, with folded arms and looks which are weapons of an unvanquished war, and that Anne in the fourth line certainly looks as if it had no legitimate business there. Sense and rhythm alike would be the better for its absence, and when we find that the holograph reads, weapons of unvanquished war, what can we do but gladly accept the amendment and assume an undiscovered error of transcription? It may be mentioned that this stanza in the Hunt manuscript is one of four consecutive stanzas, conspicuous for the absence of a single trace of Shelley's pen, employed so liberally in retouching the transcript throughout. Whatever the importance or the reverse of the results obtained by examining Shelley's manuscript, there can be no dispute as to the grave interest of the letter which Mrs. Shelley wrote to Sir John Bowring when she sent him this valuable relic. The letter contains the following paragraph. Do not be afraid of losing the impression you have concerning my lost Shelley by conversing with anyone who knew him about him. Footnote. Sick, but probably we should read, knew about him. End footnote. The mysterious feeling you experience was participated by all his friends, even by me who was ever with him. Or why say even? I felt it more than any other, because by sharing his fortune I was more aware than any other of his wondrous excellences and the strange fate which attended him on all occasions. Romance is tame in comparison with all that we experienced together, and the last fatal scene was accompanied by circumstances so strange, so inexplicable, so full of terrific interest, words are weak when one speaks of events so near the heart, 
that you would deem me very superstitious if I were only to narrate simple and incontestable facts to you. I do not in any degree believe that his being was regulated by the same laws that govern the existence of us common mortals, nor did any one think so who ever knew him. I have endeavoured, but how inadequately, to give some idea of him in my last published book, the sketch has pleased some of those who best loved him. I might have made more of it, but there are feelings which one recoils from unveiling to the public eye. I have the greatest pleasure in sending you the writing for which you ask. I have already had occasion to remark elsewhere, Athenium, January 29th, 1887, upon the foregoing confession of that mysterious feeling as to Shelley's personality, resulting from the most intimate proximity to him, and I cannot but think that a confession of this kind, on the part of a person of such strong intelligence and enlightened views, as characterised the daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, will prove a valuable memorandum for the Shelley biographer of the future, in examining several of those curious episodes in the poet's history, which have given rise to controversy and to grave doubts. But the important point here is the positive record that, in one of Mrs. Shelley's novels, she had liberated her heart in sketching a portrait of her husband. The letter is dated the 25th of February, 1826, and the latest book published by Shelley's widow at that time was The Weird and Terrible Romance of the Last Man. It has long been a familiar thought to me that Adrian Earl of Windsor in The Last Man was meant to represent Shelley in point of character, but a confession of that intention was needed to give the literary portrait solid value. Whether my friend Professor Dowden would have made use of the sketch in any way, had this evidence turned up in time, I cannot say, but I confess that, if I were engaged on a study of Shelley's character, I should regard as a document of real value, this study of the same, which his widow wove into the fabric of the last man, though I might not have ventured to appeal to it, without the absolute certainty that the author's deliberate intention was to depict Shelley. The statement that the sketch pleased some of those who best loved him is one which we can readily accept as based upon genuine expressions of satisfaction. We might expect to find, if the materials for search existed, statements to that effect from Lee Hunt and Thomas Jefferson Hogg, Claire Claremont and Jane Williams, but we must be content for the present to let one alone of these four devoted friends of Shelley speak for himself. Professor Dowden tells me that Hogg in that same year, 1826, pronounced the character which Mrs. Shelley had drawn in The Last Man to be most happy and most just. Beside this portrait of Shelley, The Last Man contains other studies after nature. Lord Raymond is certainly intended to represent Byron in an idealised form, and the character of Perdita is drawn in so intimate and analytical a manner that one cannot doubt there is much in the material for that character that was derived from experience. Any future biographer of Shelley would certainly do well to make a scrupulous examination of the inner life of Perdita as recorded in The Last Man, and collate with direct records the various passages that seem to bear upon the life of Shelley and Mary. Curiously enough, there is one point that links Perdita with the holograph Mask of Anarchy. At the back of one of the leaves are a few lines of Italian which turn out on examination to be a translation from the opening of Epipsychidion, that poem which Trelawney declared to have been first composed in Italian, and which embodies a philosophy of divided love, such as cannot in the nature of things have been satisfactory to Shelley's wife. Indeed, I think her inclusion of this wondrous poem, issued anonymously, among the acknowledged works of Shelley, was an act of some heroism, an act of stoical justice to his poetic reputation, but characterised by reserve that is unusual in Mrs. Shelley's treatment of her husband's works. Epipsychidion is the one poem of importance which Mrs. Shelley was not at the pains to comment on, or in any way elucidate, and it is at least remarkable that we should find expressions of Perdita in The Last Man combating the philosophy of divided love. When Perdita finds out that her husband's allegiance to her is divided, her life is, so to speak, wrecked. She writes him a letter containing the following passage. I loved you, I love you. Neither anger nor pride dictates these lines, but a feeling beyond, deeper, 
are more unutterable than either. My affectations are wounded. It is impossible to heal them. Cease then the vain endeavour, if indeed that way your endeavours tend. Forgiveness, return, idle words are these. I forgive the pain I endure, but the trodden path cannot be retraced. Common affection might have been satisfied with common usages. I believed that you read my heart and knew its devotion, its unalienable fidelity towards you. I never loved any but you. You came the embodied image of my fondest dreams. The praise of men, power and high aspirations attended your career. Love for you invested the world for me in enchanted light. It was no longer the earth I trod, the earth common mother, yielding only trite and stale repetition of objects and circumstances old and worn out. I lived in a temple, glorified by intensest sense of devotion and rapture. I walked, a consecrated being, contemplating only your power, your excellence. For, oh, you stood beside me like my youth, transformed for me the real to a dream, clothing the palpable and familiar with golden exhalations of the dawn. The bloom has vanished from my life. There is no morning to this all-investing night, no rising to the set sun of love. In those days the rest of the world was nothing to me. All other men I never considered nor felt what they were, nor did I look on you as one of them, separated from them, exalted in my heart, sole possessor of my affections, single object of my hopes, the best half of myself. Ah, Raymond, were we not happy? Did the sun shine on any who could enjoy its light with purer and more intense bliss? It was not... It is not a common infidelity at which I repine. It is the disunion of a whole which may not have parts. It is the carelessness with which you have shaken off the mantle of election with which to me you were invested, and have become one among the many. Dream not to alter this. Is not love a divinity because it is immortal? Did not I appear sanctified even to myself because this love had for its temple my heart? I have gazed on you as you slept, melted even to tears as the idea filled my mind that all I possessed lay cradled in those idolised but mortal lineaments before me. Yet even then I have checked thick coming fears with one thought. I would not fear death, for the emotions that linked us must be immortal. And now I do not fear death. I shall be well pleased to close my eyes, never more to open them again. And yet I fear it, even as I fear all things, for in any state of being linked by the chain of memory with this, happiness would not return, even in paradise. I must feel that your love was less enduring than the mortal beatings of my fragile heart, every pulse of which knells audibly. The funeral note of love, deep buried without resurrection. No, no, me miserable, for love extinct, there is no resurrection. The whole letter from which this is taken is a very noble one, at once impassioned and dignified, and on a higher level than I should expect to find maintained in the utterance of one of Mrs. Shelley's characters drawn from simple imagination. After the letter there is a conversation between Perdita and her brother, in which she says, Do you think that any of your arguments are new to me? or that my own burning wishes and intense anguish have not suggested them all a thousand times, with far more eagerness and subtlety than you can put into them. Lionel, you cannot understand what woman's love is. In days of happiness, I have often repeated to myself with a grateful heart and exulting spirit all that Raymond sacrificed for me. I was a poor, uneducated, unbefriended mountain girl, raised from nothingness by him. All that I possessed of the luxuries of life came from him. He gave me an illustrious name and noble station, the world's respect reflected from his own glory. All this, joined to his own undying love, inspired me with sensations towards him, akin to those with which we regard the giver of life. I gave him love only. I devoted myself to him. Imperfect creature that I was, I took myself to task that I might become worthy of him. I watched over my hasty temper, subdued my burning impatience of character, schooled my self-engrossing thoughts, 
educating myself to be the best perfection I might attain, that the fruit of my exertions might be his happiness. I took no merit to myself for this. He deserved it all, all labour, all devotion, all sacrifice. I would have toiled up a scaleless alp to pluck a flower that would please him. I was ready to quit you all, my beloved and gifted companions, and to live only with him, for him. I could not do otherwise, even if I had wished, for if we are said to have two souls, he was my better soul, to which the other was a perpetual slave. One only return did he owe me, even fidelity. I earned that, I deserved it, because I was mountain-bred, unallied to the noble and wealthy. Shall he think to repay me by an empty name and station? Let him take them back. Without his love, they are nothing to me. Their only merit in my eyes was that they were his. Without looking beyond the mere significance of the words, I should like to accept that utterance as coming direct from Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, and I for once should certainly cherish her memory the more warmly for it. While preparing my notes on the circumstances in which the Mask of Anarchy was produced, I have received from a member of the Shelley Society, who was travelling through Italy by the special train service provided for the Indian mails, a most interesting letter, bearing upon Shelley's influence in a manner more appropriate, perhaps, to this particular poem than any other. In the bed below my correspondent in the sleeping car was Mr. H. M. Stanley on his way to Emin Bay, very quiet and thoughtful, talking little. He picked up my friend's copy of the Shelley Society's report upon its first year's work, just issued, and asked for information about the Society. "'I'm afraid,' said Mr. Stanley, "'I'm a poorly educated man, but Shelley, I take it, wrote for such, not, begging your pardon, for the literary connoisseurs, who now take him up, patronise, puff, and dissect him.' "'Not patronise,' said my correspondent, though perhaps puff. Yet, after all, is not the puff delicate a fair means of spreading good doctrines among good men? Mr. Stanley rejoined, Some lines of Shelley live with me, as some of Leopardi's do with most Italians. He was for freedom, so am I. He had go, he had enthusiasm. Then, after a pause, You are a funny people, you Shelleyites. You are playing at a safe distance yourselves, may be, with fire. In spreading Shelley, you are indirectly helping to stir up the great socialist question, the great question of the needs and wants and wishes of unhappy men, the one question which bids fair to swamp you all for a bit. Stanley bade farewell to his car companion at Brindisi, leaving the impression that he well knew the question of his ever getting back to be a hazardous one, and taking with him by way of solace my friend's copy of the Shelley Society's reprint of Alastor. Such a glimpse as this of the impression produced by Shelley on a man of vigorous mind and strong practical proclivities is more interesting because far more difficult to obtain than many pages of accomplished literary judgments. Still, if it be true that the spread of Shelley's influence tends to stir up the socialist question, it is true only in the sense in which the spread of the gospel may be similarly considered. The Nazarene carpenter was far more a typical socialist than Shelley was and yet we do not throw it in the teeth of the clergy that the doctrines of him whom they profess tend to stir up and force forward the socialist question. But if this verdict on Shelley's influence be true in any serious and immediate sense, it should be peculiarly applicable to the poem with which we are now particularly concerned, to the Mask of Anarchy, and to that group of poems written in 1819 with the view to awakening Englishmen to a sense of their degradation, their rights and their powers. Now let us take one passage from the Mask of Anarchy. We might fearlessly take the whole poem, with its ardent advocacy of a bloodless resistance to force and fraud, but one passage will suffice. Let the laws of your own land, good or ill, between ye stand, hand to hand and foot to foot, arbiters of the dispute. The old laws of England, they whose reverend heads with age are grey, children of a wiser day, and whose solemn voice must be thine own echo, liberty, on those who first should violate such sacred heralds in their state, rest the blood that must ensue, and it will not rest on you. This appeal to the wisdom of English law is not much like the bedrock nonsense of the professional socialist, is it? Well, that is Shelley's way of stirring up the socialist question, 
and I think we may rest satisfied that Mr. Stanley has carried off the impression of some part of the trappings of Shelley's poetry without going to the root of what he really meant. Nevertheless, it is, as I said before, extremely interesting to learn what impression there is in the mind of such a man concerning Shelley and his teachings. Again, as to Shelley's poems being written for the half-educated, if that be true of anything besides Queen Mab, it is of the Mask of Anarchy and the small political group of 1819. That group is by no means representative. It is a distinctly poor group compared with other work of the period from the same hand, and even the Mask, splendid as it is in impulse and imaginative treatment, does not gain and could not gain from the violence done to Shelley's native manner and style, in the earnest desire to reach the hearts and minds of the struggling proletariat of his own day. Of course, in a certain sense, the most enlightened of Shelley's readers are only half educated, and the more enlightened a man is, the less will he be likely to lay claim to more than half an education, in the widest sense of the word. But here the question is one of comparison, and setting Shelley beside his contemporaries, say beside Byron, Scott and Wordsworth, I should say that about three times as much education would be required to read Shelley's works with comfort as would be wanted for the like perusal of Byron, Scott's and Wordsworth's works together. This admission would probably be taken by the world at large as counting against Shelley and in favour of Byron, Scott and Wordsworth. Well, if it be so, so it is, you know, and if it be so, so be it. We who love Shelley and his poetry can afford to take him as he is, and do our best to educate ourselves up to the necessary standard for a full and fruitful intelligence of all he meant and all he was. End of the Mask of Anarchy